All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. It's Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Horton. And our next guest on the show today is Luke Cote. He is the co-producer and co-director of You Don't Like the Truth, Four Days Inside Guantanamo. Welcome to the show, Luke. How are you? I'm quite fine, and you? I'm doing great. I appreciate you joining us on the show today. No problem. My pleasure. Uh... Also, I appreciate you making this movie. Uh, unbelievable stuff here. I guess why don't you go ahead and give us the background of what this video is, how you got it, and then maybe, I know it's difficult, but if you could give us the briefest sketch of the so-called war crimes case against Omar Khadr to, to set us up for the story here. Okay. Uh, well, you know that in 2008 the Supreme Court of Canada uh, released some video that was taken in Guantanamo in 2003 by the Canadian Intelligence Service, CSIS. And the Omar Khadr's lawyer, it's, a, it's an interrogation of Omar Khadr, a young Canadian who was caught in uh, Afghanistan when he was 15 years old, and he's been, to, he's been caught by the Americans. He, he was taken to Bagram and then to Guantanamo. And by the time he was uh, in Guantanamo, he was 16 years old. And so some people from the Secret Service went to Guantanamo to interrogate for four days Omar Khadr. Omar Khadr's lawyer knew that these guys, they went there, and they tried for five years. They fought in every court there is you know, up to the Supreme Court of Canada to get access to this material, to this interrogation. And finally, in 2000, in July 2008, they got access to, to the material. And the lawyers, what they did, they, they edited a little piece, a 10-minute piece of this uh, seven hours and more that they got, that they received from the Supreme Court. They made a little editing of, uh, of this interrogation, and, the most, the, the, and, and mainly the part that is the most... Uh, you know, the dramatic where uh, Omar Khadr is crying and asking for his mom. And we, uh, we understand he was 16 years old. And, uh, and, uh, so at that point, you know, uh, my uh, co-director, uh, Patricio Enriquez and I, we saw this piece on the news. We saw it, you know, on the web because that was posted to everybody to see. And this, these clips, they went around the world. And uh, at that moment, uh, Patricio and I, we decided that we need to do something with this material because this is unbelievable. And, and I have to say, you know, like almost uh, more than three years later, it is still the only footage available out of Guantanamo from inside Guantanamo, what yeah. go, what's going on there. Because we know for a fact that all the interrogations and thousands and thousands of them are recorded. And the only way we got this one is really because they were Canadians, Secret Service, who went there, and they brought back this material because as a transcript, you know, to, to, as a reference, because never we would have gotten this material from the Pentagon or from, uh, from the Americans. A impossible. So it was really because that was Canadians, and, but this material was never supposed to be released, never. And so finally we, we got this material and we decided, we started to look at it like everybody else because a lot of people got it, like I said. And, uh, but we started, we started to study the material and we spent a lot of time watching it over and over to realize that we had a, a we have a mine of information here and the idea is that what do we do with this now? How do we put it together? And so we started to, re to do research and we decided, you know, that, uh, we would cut like the best part of the interview, the interrogation. And the interrogation was over a four day period. So we took, we look at every day and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a funny thing because, you know, this war on terror costs billions of dollars to the Americans. And yet, you know, when they do these interrogation, they use like the cheapest quality camera, the, you know, like worse than VHS. The sound is terrible. So we had to listen and to watch for many, many, many hours to try to get a transcript of what, what was being said. And uh, at the end, you know, we, we, we saw that we had uh, wonderful, wonderful material, and we decided to try to give it a context. So we approached a lot of people who were in contact with Omar Khadr when he was in Bagram in Afghanistan and in Guantanamo. And we approached these people so that they can uh, give a context to what we're seeing in the interrogation. So the main core of the film is really half of the film is the interrogation, and the other half 
uh, it's people who knew Omar Khadr from ex mate in Bagram and in Guantanamo. We even have an American uh, soldier who was a, a torturer in Bagram, who is in the film. We have his lawyers, we have a psychologist. Uh, his mother, his uh, his sister, and all these people can give us an insight of what's going on. So basically, that's that's the premise of the film, and that that's what it is. And, and it's so- really it's such an accomplishment. And uh, I guess I want to stop right here uh, just to uh, let you tell people how they can buy this thing because obviously it costs money to make. And uh, you need to sell DVDs. You need uh, people to show up at, I'm sure, the few art house type theaters where it's playing and see this thing. It's certainly worth the seven bucks or whatever. So please take this time to plug the movie itself. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, it's been it's been a great adventure because the film has been uh, going around the world. We just came back from from Argentina uh, yesterday, and the film was has been shown in more than uh, 55 festivals around the world. It was shown at the Film Forum in New York, and the other other cinemas in in the U.S. that are now presenting the film. So, what I suggest to your viewer, to your uh, to your people, is that they can um, log to our website. And it's very easy. It's you don't like the truth dot com. You don't like the truth dot com altogether. And then on the website, they can see where the film is being screened. They can see where they can buy it too, if they want to buy a, a copy, a DVD copy of it. So it's 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 all available there on the website. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's pretty easy to imagine, isn't it? Uh, where that phrase comes from? You don't like the truth. That's someone telling the truth, insisting to a military intelligence officer that, what's the point? You keep telling me to talk, and every time I talk, you tell me I'm a liar, so what do you want? Which lie do you want me to tell? Go ahead, give me my line. I guess I'll repeat it for you if that's what you want. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's sad. Exactly. It really is, and you mentioned the part where he's crying for his mother, and uh, I don't think this is just you know a child throwing a temper tantrum type of thing. I mean, this is really the epitome of complete despair and hopelessness here you you uh, make it very clear kind of with the interviews and the narration and whatever what's going on here where the first day he's really excited that finally some canadians have come and maybe they are a lifeline to anything like a path out of his legal black hole that he's in already a uh, body full of shrapnel and having been abused in uh, bagram prison and i'm not exactly sure what they did to him in guantanamo i don't know if you can speak to that but uh, well his, it was his hopes are abuse. very quickly dashed and he is uh, at the very edge of despair there uh, maybe over the edge of completely breaking down where he's I, I believe not just crying out for his mother, but he's crying out to just go ahead and die. Please let me die. He's saying. Mm-hmm. No, it's 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 a very very emotional part. It's the second day where he's is really like, uh, you know, he breaks down. It's the second day because, like you said, the first day he's very happy to see Canadians because you have to remember that all the Western countries at one point they they went to Guantanamo to get their prisoners to bring them back home. All the Western countries. And Omar Khadr is the only Western prisoner left in Guantanamo for all this time. And it's incredible because all the other ones, they were released in 2003, 4, 5. They were all gone, the French, the German, the, the British, and all of them, you know. But Omar Khadr have been stuck in Guantanamo for all these years. And uh, so, yes, the first day, you know, it's a, finally they're here. I've been waiting for you guys, Canadians, you know, because you really think that they're from the, the, the consular affair. And the thing is, they're very nice to him the first day. You know, they come and, oh, have you, uh, have you been eating? You know, we have McDonald's or Subway here. You want a Coca-Cola, you know, and they're trying, you know, to be nice with him. And now tell us a little bit about yourself. They're just trying to get more intelligence. All the stuff that he's said in the past to the Americans, you know, to to the CIA and to the Pentagon, and they're just trying to get more of it. And then right, I'm sorry, day, Luke, I'm going to have to cut you off here. The music's playing. We got to go out and take this break. No uh, problem. We'll be right back, everybody, with Luke Cote from uh, I forgot the name of the production company, but it's You Don't Like the Truth. dot com. Four days inside Guantanamo. We'll be right back after this. All right, y'all. Welcome back to the show. It's anti-war radio. And the movie is called You Don't Like the Truth. Four Days Inside Guantanamo. 
Luke Cote. Co-produced it and co-directed it. It's the story of Omar Cotter. Uh, video footage of four days of his interrogation at the hands of Canadian military intelligence at Guantanamo Bay, as well as interviews with his cellmates and uh, various lawyers and experts and family members and everything else. And it's the story of a kid, a 15-year-old kid whose dad supposedly was friends with the bad guys over there in Afghanistan. And the kid was left in this house with these fighters. He was supposed to serve as a translator for them for whatever purposes. And he got caught in a firefight. And they accused him quite implausibly, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit, Luke, of throwing a grenade at a medic, which is a war crime, except that he wasn't doing medicine at the time. He was a member of the Delta Force with a gun in his hand raiding a house, and uh, the evidence is uh, quite to the contrary of even the possibility that Omar Cotter had thrown a grenade at this guy in the first place. But then, so they called it a war crime. They put him in Bagram for, I think, a year uh, and um, then sent him to Guantanamo Bay. And now I was hoping, Luke, you could help fill in some of that, particularly uh, his treatment, the threats against his family, and uh, the way he was treated at Bagram and then again at uh, Guantanamo Bay, this uh, 15 and then 16-year-old boy, this victim of circumstance, this child soldier who's supposedly protected by 10,000 laws. Exactly. And you, you know, when he was <clears throat> in Afghanistan, you have to understand that he's been traveling with his family. He was just accompanying his family, his father, his okay. mother, you know, his father also, you know, even though they say that he had links with uh, uh, Al-Qaeda, with, with bin Laden, he had orphanages, you know, in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and we do this this round of this orphanages, and, and Omar and his family, you know, his brothers and sisters, they would be with their with their family. So when he, when he ended up in that compound where that was bombarded by the by the uh, the, the military, you know, he, he he was there, and at the end, you know, he was the sole survivor of this. But he was, even though he was the sole survivor, he was badly injured because he received like two bullet wounds, bullet wounds huge that you can fit a can of beer inside each one of them. You know, it, it's a uh, you know it. That he's still alive, it's unbelievable. He should have been dead, you know, because it was right in the chest, you know, and uh, so it went from from front to back. It was just open, open wounds. And he had shrapnels all over the place in his eyes, and today he's, he's blind from, from one eye, and he's losing slowly the other one. And they say that in that mess, because there were a ground troop who were attacking the place, and there was also bombarded from the air, you know. So the place was disseminated totally totally gone and they say that when the, the these members from the delta force arrived there you know this guy who's like bleeding on his back and you know in the with the shrapnel and everything else supposedly he rose from the rubbles and he threw a grenade that killed christopher spear one of the guy that they refer as a medic because he took a class as a medic, but he was really there as a Delta, Delta Force, and everybody has confirmed it. And we know what is the Delta Force. The Delta Force is something that even the, um, the American Army doesn't acknowledge that, that it exists, because they're, these guys, they're there to kill. That's their mission. And, and so Omar Khadr was, you know, then he was, he, they didn't kill him. With all these injuries, you know, he, they took him on a stretcher, and they brought it to Bagram. And he, he, he fell, he fell unconscious in the helicopter carrying him. And he, he was unconscious for a week. Then he woke up in this hospital in Bagram. And then they started to, uh, to, to interrogate him. Because they knew when he arrived and all, a lot of ex-detainees that we inter interrogated to interviewed over the, for, for this film, some guys from uh, Australia and others from, uh, from uh, Great Britain. They all told us that when they arrived, everybody said, oh, he's the bad guy. He killed one of ours. And he was treated worse than anybody else in background. He was, in fact, interviewed more than, uh, interrogated more than 49 times by this American soldier. And I, I know most likely you, you, you've heard of the film, another incredible film called Taxi from the Dark Side. And the guy who, who killed this taxi driver in that movie, the American soldier, who, uh, Joshua Klaus, who killed this taxi driver who was totally innocent, he's the same guy who interrogated Omar Khadr 49 times in background. So he is, 
you know, is vicious, he's been torturing people, and uh, for the death of this guy in background for the taxi driver, he got like six months, supposedly, and no one is sure that he really served the six months of prison. But for Omar Khadr, you know, he was repeatedly tortured, abused uh, at every level. And I won't go into the details of, you know, all the stuff that, that, that went on because it's the same kind of stuff that you saw with the pictures in Abu Ghraib, you know, with the dogs, with the rape, with uh, all that stuff. And he was, he was in, uh, he was in Bagram, you know, he was arrested in, in July and he was there until, uh, until January, when he was moved to when they opened Guantanamo. I'm January, sorry, I'm sorry, Luke. I, ha- I have to follow up on on that uh, fact. I'm I'm not sure because the way he stated it, whether it's a generalization or specifically, you're saying that Omar Khadr was raped at Bagram. Uh, uh, no, they, they they he was not raped. You know, he was uh, there was a lot of uh, kind of sexual abuse, naked and that kind of stuff. He was not raped, but he was threatened to be raped. I see. Okay, that I was just wanted to nail that, that down uh, from the way you said it wasn't quite yeah. specific, you know, but anyway, yeah. so yeah. please continue. And uh, then he was, uh, so he, he was really, he was really tortured. And they say, and and a lot of other prisoners, they say too, in the hospital where he was, where, where he was, because he needed a lot of treatment for all the injuries and the wounds that he had, in the hospital they would purposely, you know, take him from, you know, make him get up and take him by the wound so that to be sure that he was suffering. And so he went to, he went through all that stuff, you know, like, uh, you know, putting stacks of bottles and then to throw them down again and to have him to do it again and uh, just physical pain, you know, and on top with the, all the psychological pain that he went through. And in Guantanamo, it continued, it continued, and he was also part in Guantanamo of the uh, of the famous program, you know, the frequent flyer program. So before interrogation, he would be taken from, uh, you know, they, they they would try for, for three weeks before an interrogation. They they were sleep deprived. So in his case, you know, every hour they would move move him from one cell to another, so that to be sure that he never sleeps or you know he's always on this on a dreaming state but never deep sleep. So and they felt that after three weeks, when the you know, when the interrogator would come, uh, they would they would be much easier. And and Corsetti tells us, you know, also that this sleep deprivation, this frequent flyer program, he said, really worked because these guys they were hallucinating, you know, for the lack of sleep. They were like, uh, you know, they they would bang their head on the wall. They was just, just like getting crazy. So he was also subjected to that kind of stuff when he was in Guantanamo. And now I'm trying to remember. Uh... Wasn't it the case that one interrogator said that when he arrived at Guantanamo Bay, the first thing he saw was Omar Cotter hanging from the wall? Uh, no. Or am I confusing no, uh, him with another child that yeah, was held I there? Yeah, I think so, because uh, I didn't hear that from... Uh, okay, do you know about, was he abused at Guantanamo Bay? Uh, you know... Obviously, we know that he was we know that he was tortured also in Guantanamo Bay, and we know that he was part of that frequent flyer program. Uh, it was, you know, they were the still doing the frequent flyer at Gitmo, yeah. Yeah, and we know also that at Gitmo that he went uh, he went uh, he participated in the hunger strike that a lot of prisoners did, and they were force feeded too, and which is oh. very painful experience. Sure, too. Yeah. So well, that he was part of that. And then uh, they had him football. plead guilty. Basically, he was facing forever and ever and ever. And so they made him plead guilty and get, what, eight years or something? Yeah. What happened is uh, all this time, he always said that he never did it, that he was not guilty, that he never threw this grenade that killed Christopher Street. So they made him lie and accept responsibility. Well, for at the end, you know what it. happened? It's exactly a year ago, last October, okay, 2010. You know, they, they were ready to, to have his trial. And so his lawyers, they, they went down to Guantanamo. And you have to understand that uh, when I say trial, it's a joke because it's a military commission. And a military commission, we all know what it is. The judge is a, is, is a soldier. The yeah. juries well, are soldiers. Well, the whole soldiers. law has been made up Everybody in this century. We know, yeah, it's all okay. ridiculous. Okay, go ahead. Exactly. Very quickly. So now. from the beginning, the, the, the lawyer, the Canadian lawyers who represent Omar Khadr, what they wanted from the judge is to say, listen, from the beginning – we need to get rid of all this statement that was done, that was given on the torture. And then the judge decided at that point that no, you know, everything he said will be acceptable. All right, you guys, and, you have to see this. It's called You Don't Like the Truth. 
four days inside Guantanamo. You don't like the truth. Dot com. It's playing in many cities, perhaps yours. You can order the DVD. You have to see this. You have to show it to people. Thank you so much for your time, Luke. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Luke Cote, everybody, co-director and co-producer of You Don't Like the Truth, Four Days of Guantanamo Bay.